Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity Monthly Series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. The series is held the first Thursday of every month. And today we will discuss analytic translators. How do they fit the literacy discussion? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists. We may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker of our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value as a sense maker and analytic translator. A talented researcher and consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies, startups, and healthcare giants, her own work has focused on the application of big data solutions in health and human capital management. An author of books on effective communication analytics, Wendy has pioneered the only structured system to empower a new generation of professionals who will revolutionize the successful application of data to solve business challenges. These trains, trained analytic translators allow companies to convert advanced analytics into actionable solutions, building a sustainable alliance between analytic and business professionals. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to get to the presentation started. Wendy, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. <clears throat> it's always a pleasure to join you, and it's always a pleasure to have folks from Dataversity joining us. So for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. For those who have joined us before, welcome back. Today we'll talk about analytic translators. It's a role that is not familiar to a lot of people, but it's probably something that some of you have already been doing to some extent, um, or you know somebody in your group who acts in this role. I actually was an analytic translator for about 20 years before I actually realized that that was what I was doing. So an analytic translator, let's define it. An analytic translator is an advisor who is trusted by both data professionals and business professionals to crystallize, explain, and shepherd complex analytic projects efficiently and collaboratively from the very beginning of the initial concept to some sort of a valuable outcome, like a decision or application that's relevant to the business done in ways that recognize and elevate the contribution of everyone involved. We're gonna come back to that part of it a few different times today. But if you haven't really heard about this role, this is probably the best definition. Now, another part of analytic translation that some people don't know is that it is equal parts analytic know-how and communication know-how. So individuals who train with me to become an analytic translator get to know skills from both of these sources because if you don't know how to talk to people and you don't know how to ask the right questions, it's hard to bring everyone together. So today's about why we might need analytic translators. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to convince you that we have a problem. And I would say we have a big problem. That big problem is something that we hear about all the time in management journals, especially from the business side. Business leaders understand that many, many, many of the data projects that they initiate don't end up delivering the value that they expected. We see more and more articles, even one just a month ago, about how few companies, I think it's 16% of companies, have truly accomplished being data-driven. According to McKinsey, about 87% of data science projects never make it into production. 
And this spring, I saw an article summarizing that despite 20 years of advancement, 70% of dashboards are really not used by their intended audience. Then as we see all of these answers and these highlights, we've seen lately, and this was just last December, that we're falling into the same level of failure in AI. Most AI projects fail and some of the estimates put the failure rate at 80%. So these are the summaries that I see when I'm reading journals and Forbes and Harvard Business Review. But last fall, I wanted to find out for myself. And so I did a series of interviews of 20 executives in charge of data and data analytics. And I have an entire report, but I'm gonna give a couple of highlights that are pertinent today to what we're talking about. And so among other things, I asked them about, specifically about the dynamic that we experience between analytic teams and business teams. Now, if you have been in this arena, which by that I mean a data-oriented role inside a business, you know that there is often a strained dynamic. And so I asked them to describe that. I asked them to describe how big of a problem it is, and I asked them why they think it happens. So some of the answers are answers that you would expect to hear. One is how fast the speed of work really happens. You get quick communications, very cryptic, in email or in Slack. You get urgent requests that need to be completed much faster than you think is humanly possible. And so you have this pace behind requests and interactions that make things almost impossible. You get a request that says, I need something by tomorrow, but we don't even know what it is that the person is talking about. The problem also happens because of a very real perception that was expressed by these executives on the data side, that they believe that the business leaders don't understand or value what analytics can do. They really don't know. Then if the data come in and it goes against something they already believe, then they start to not necessarily trust it. Then on top of that, they start to think of analytics as a cost center rather than a revenue generating aspect of the business, meaning that we're spending money on it rather than it delivering value to us. And that analytic leaders, they admitted they didn't really know how to advocate or convince the business leaders why and how they provide value. On the flip side, the analytic leaders also said, you know, I don't know that we really delve into what the person is really asking for. So we just take literally what they have asked us and try and go with it rather than really understanding what they need because we're taking their language as and converting it into what we think it means. The terminologies between the two teams are often very misunderstood. And what we mean by one thing may not be what they mean. And then we make assumptions that they know exactly what they're asking for and that we can express it in our language even though they don't understand that. So after going through all of these things that they say are the reasons I finished with a question where I said, if we think about what ideally these two teams could do together, if the dynamic was really synergistic, compared to that ideal, how much less effective 
are your teams. And it was quite surprising. 19 out of 20 said, I know this is having a negative impact. But 50% of these answers, so 10 out of 20 of these executives says that they their teams are at least 50% less effective than they could be. And several of them said, we are probably 75 to 80% less effective than we could be if we actually could communicate and collaborate the way we need to. So this is, this is big. This is not just a few misunderstandings here. And people ask me, so, so what do you think the value really is? And so I'm gonna try and put a few numbers around it. What is miscommunication between analytic teams and business teams costing us? Well, let's start with number one, wasted time and effort. People tell me all the time that they send information back because the analyst didn't give them what they wanted. Or the analysts say, I gave them what they said they wanted, but then they said that that wasn't it. And so we had to redo it. So if we look at all of those headlines and we look at what the executives told me that they're 50% or 75% less efficient than they could be, that's a lot of rework. So let's say we have employees that are high level analysts, $100,000 salary plus benefits plus tools that they need and computing power and training. And so let's say each employee, we spend about $150,000 on them. And let's take a team of 10 analysts. So that would be $1.5 million on those 10 analysts. If we're talking about a 25% failure rate, that means that 25% of their work was not as effective as it could have been. That would be about $375,000. If they are 50% doing the wrong task or having to redo the work, 750,000, 75%, as you can see. And if we go with McKinsey at 85% failure rate on 10 analysts, it's costing us $1.3 million in work that has to be redone or it just simply gets wasted. So let's be conservative. Let's say it's a 50% failure rate and that only half of that is attributable to communication. So I'm gonna keep whittling it down. So that would mean we're at $375,000 for 10 analysts simply because they're having to do rework and they didn't understand each other. Second reason. Well, how frustrated and discouraged do you think these people are? And those executives that I talked to said they really, really worry about their teams because they keep getting told they got it wrong. They keep getting told that they didn't do what the business needed them to do. And so they get demoralized. An article I read last year said that Data analysts seem to be leaving jobs every two years because they don't think their skills are being used. They don't know if they're gonna have a career trajectory with the organization and they just don't feel engaged. They do not feel valued. If it's everyone every two years, that means half of them every year are gonna leave. Now you can decide how much it costs uh, the HR literature says it's 75% of salary to recruit, hire, onboard, and train people before they get to be useful and running on all cylinders. So we're talking about 750000 on that. And when you are demoralized, when you aren't engaged in your work, when you do not feel appreciated, your productivity goes down by at least a third. So this category number two, we're replacing half of them and at three quarters of salary and the re remaining of them are operating at 
33% below optimal, which adds up to about $500,000. Now, last and probably the most consequential that people overlook is missed opportunity. So imagine if your data teams and your business teams were completely in sync. What if they appreciated what each other brought to the table? What if they collaborated in such a way that they anticipated what the other team needed and, and thought of it before they even asked for it because they're so clued in to what the other team does. Imagine what a difference those data services could make to the business. Imagine what the business folks could help the data folks learn. So let's say they're operating on all cylinders. Don't you think that those data folks could think of new ways to quantify the value of products in ways that it would advance their marketing message. One out of 30 messages would be better. That would be 3% if somebody, um, let's say the company makes 10 million in revenue. 3% improvement would be $300,000. Let's say one in 20 messages now are much more effective. That'd be a 5% improvement. You could also imagine that if they really are tuned in and they are extracting new insights from the data, it could be even 10% improvement. But let's just say 5% improvement in marketing. What about new products? What if the data analysts and data scientists are scouring the data and seeing that different customer subgroups need different types of products? Maybe they know how to target them differently. Maybe they even can see new opportunities and an add-on to the current services that they provide. Again, can't we imagine that all of that brain power could increase, increase the types and value and price of products by 3% or 5% or 10%? Again, let's just say a 5% improvement. And then lastly, efficiencies. When you are looking at operational data, you can probably find many, many ways that you could improve the way that the business is running simply by looking at the information. So we'll just conservatively say $100,000, a 1% improvement in operations that could save 1% of revenue. If we put all of that together, you can quibble with me about whether it's 5% or 3%, whether it costs 75% of someone's salary to replace them or 50% of salary to replace them. But if we put it all together, 10 analysts in a $10 million revenue organization, miscommunication between these teams, the flawed broken dynamic between these teams is costing $2 million for 10 analysts. 4 million for 20 analysts, 10 million for 50 analysts. These are not small numbers. These are real losses that are happening because we don't communicate well. So hopefully I have convinced you that we do have a big problem. So, what do companies tend to do? Well, most of the time, what I hear and what we cover a lot in this webinar is that what we want as data professionals is for everyone to become like us. We want everyone to become data literate. We want to take these folks with low literacy who don't understand the biases and limitations of data, who don't understand how to interpret whether there's real relationships or differences. And so the dream of organizations is to move them 
at least a step up to moderate literacy. And even better, we want superheroes who all have high literacy. Now, I am not gonna say that this isn't a wonderful dream. It is a wonderful goal. Would things go better in many, many ways in education and business and a whole variety of other ways? Would they all improve if we all were highly data literate? Absolutely. And because we know that ideal would be so beneficial, we see a lot of headlines about why we need everyone to be literate. 90% of business leaders believe that data literacy will be critical to the success of their organizations. We also hear that the companies that are really high performing have at least 20% of their earnings related to data and analytics. That makes them more efficient, more profitable, more high performing. We also see that those companies who do achieve data mastery, being completely data driven across their people and technology and policies have 70% higher revenue per person. So it's no wonder that we think literacy is absolutely a wonderful way to pull us up, to move organizations forward in this era of needing to capitalize on data assets. So the problem that we are solving really is the perception of data folks that they need business teams to understand their language, that they need business teams to use and interpret data appropriately. So they believe that literacy is going to solve the challenges that we are faced with when we have less than ideally literate business folks and less than ideally business literate data folks. And so I always wonder, will the business teams really welcome data literacy training? I imagine that it looks a little more like this, that it's your own brand of hell to have to be looking at data sources. We also have to wonder, given an option, what choices will the business folks make? Will they head to the right or sneak off to the left? And then it also makes me wonder, is it realistic for every organization and every employee to get to the level that they need to get to in order to be highly data literate? Will they go? Do they embrace it? Is it what they feel like they need? And when we think about this, we also have to be aware of what the real numbers are. Business leaders, when they are surveyed, believe that most or all of their workers are data literate already. This was quite an amazing study in 2021. So, the majority of business leaders felt that most or all of their workers were literate, but then in surveys of the workers, only 10 to 20% were confident in their data skills. So there's an overestimation. And on top of that, when they actually interview the folks who are in the C-suite, these executives who run the company, only about a third of them are considered literate. And so then I asked the question, why is it that we assume that the business team is the only one that needs training? I think that is more than the data people who are saying the business folks need to be trained. 
So how do we, what happens when we assume that one side needs to do the work? And there is a wonderful article in Forbes. Assuming that data illiteracy is the reason companies fail to realize value from data creates a toxic divide between those who are producing data and insights and those who are supposed to receive and consume them. So in some ways, telling the business folks that they have to become literate because they are the problem just makes the dynamic between the two teams worse. So is there another way? And my answer is yes. And I'll share with you the overarching goal that I tell my students who learn to be analytic translators. Imagine if it was somebody's actual job to make both teams successful. Right now, there is no person responsible for improving the success of both teams. And what I emphasize is you want both teams to achieve clarity, confidence, and partnership. You want each side to achieve clarity, confidence, and build a powerful partnership. You want both teams to experience being appreciated, having a sense of accomplishment, and feeling trust with the other team. Now think about that. Is there anyone in your organization whose responsibility it is to build trust, to build partnership, to enhance how both teams feel about the other one and how both teams feel appreciated in themselves? So what skills do we provide to analytic translators to build this sense of cohesion and collaboration, to build this sense of trust and partnership? Well, first of all, they have to really speak both languages pretty fluently. They have to understand data, but they also need to understand business and what the priorities are for the business teams. They have to have enough familiarity and comfort, not just with the topic, but to know how each of those teams operates. What are their goals? And what are their biases? What are their fears? What are their hopes? What is the way, what do they fall back on? What's the approach that they use? Most importantly, they develop skills in communication. What are they exactly they listening for? What questions help somebody figure out what they're really trying to accomplish? How do we promote clarification without having to um, ask a, a zillion questions or have them feel like they're being interrogated? They should be dedicated to converting data into maximum business value and know how to do that. And then they need to understand how to demonstrate authentic appreciation and empathy for both teams. Imagine if somebody had that job in your organization. Maybe some of you who are listening are like, oh my God, that's exactly what I do. So maybe you are already an analytic translator. And others of you are thinking, wow, I wish we had somebody like that helping us navigate what we need to do. So what do we do now? Well, step one is simply to acknowledge what the problem is. 
And the biggest shift that I see necessary is right now, each team thinks the problem is the other team. Overwhelmingly, what I hear is they don't appreciate this. They don't understand that. They uh, provide me with things that do don't make sense. They don't give us enough background. So the problem ends up being a finger point to somebody else. Instead, the problem is the dynamic between the two. And that's a very different thing than blaming the other side. Number two, what we do is we designate. We designate a person or a team of people who become analytic translators and become skilled at navigating this relationship to start to turn it toward a level of appreciation and collaboration that doesn't exist right now. And then lastly, we prioritize the right parts of projects. And one way to do that is to prioritize the handoffs that occur between the two teams. So when I think about the business environment and the analytic environment in most companies that I work with, they operate relatively separately. It's not that they don't interact with each other a lot, but they really have their own domains. And as a first step, when we think about what the problem in quotes really is, is to realize that in the business setting, we assume as an analytic translator that it is populated by talented, capable, well-intended people. Nobody gets up in the morning with a goal that we're just gonna make data people look bad. They are just doing what they need to do and they have the intention to try and perform well, and provide value to the organization. Similarly, the data and analytic teams are full of talented, capable, well-intended people as well. If we start with that presumption, then we realize again that it's something that has happened between the two, not that one group is all idiots and the other group knows what they're doing, even though I have seen situations where they really do talk about each other in that way because they've developed such a dysfunctional relationship. So a typical project goes something like this. We start in the business environment. There's a request. Oh my gosh, we need to know about X. They send some kind of a request over the fence to the analytic environment where they say, oh, I know how to answer that question. They figure out the data sets, how they're gonna design it. They run the analysis, spit out some results and throw it back over the fence to the business folks. There are many places that projects go off track. The one that I hear most about is a lack of understanding at this juncture. What happens is the business team says, you know, every time I ask for something, I, I don't get what I need. And I wanted to know how much does that really happen? And so I did a survey on LinkedIn. And I said, if you're a business person who works with analytic teams, how often do you get and understand the exact answers that you need? And what we see is that two thirds of the time, they say not often or maybe sometimes. And they're frustrated and don't feel like they are getting good value from the question that they asked. So we see a lot of dysfunction at that handoff. What many people think 
is that they need better visualization skills. And there's over 5,000 books on Amazon on how to present your data differently to make it more appealing. But I would say that the real handoff that is a problem is this one. Because we don't get the question right the first time. Again, we can say, well, that's the business's fault because they don't know how to ask the questions because they don't understand the data. The business can say, well, I made it as clear as I could and those analysts just don't seem to understand basic business language. So they keep on making it more complicated than it really is or they don't understand what I'm asking. And there is a ton of frustration. I also surveyed analytic folks data scientists who work in the business setting. And I said, so can you describe what those requests are like? Do you get a context for why they're asking or what the purpose is behind it? Do they ask for your input? And essentially 19% said never. 47% I get a little bit of context, but I never get asked my opinion. Only 8% said they have great collaborative relationships. So once again, two thirds are having problems at the very beginning. And if you think back on the how demoralized the analytic leaders talked about their teams feeling, if you think that every time you get a request, you're probably answering the wrong question, no wonder you don't feel like you're providing value. And there's one more period of time where there are some handoffs. Now it may not be a delivery or it may not be the actual request, but in the middle of projects, we all know that things go a little sideways. We discover something about the data set or we discover something about subpopulations or we discover something about uh, any aspect of the question where we think, huh, maybe we should be doing it this way or that way. But if we're not communicating in a constructive way, if a dialogue is not welcomed by both sides, then we can't course correct in the middle. We can't get ourselves to where we need to go. And I have asked this question as well. How often are you able to provide the exact answer that the business wants, and I ask this of analytic folks, the first time with no rework. Only 5% said they did that every single time. Almost 40% said almost never. And again, two thirds say it's less than half the time or never. So there is so much room for improvement. And these have nothing to do with whether or not we have talented data scientists. These have nothing to do with whether we have talented business executives. The problem is all between the two teams in the way they communicate and the way that they interact with each other. So these are the handoffs that we spend time understanding. We spend time understanding the language and questions that will help us get clearer at each of these points. These are the handoffs where we know we can make or break a project and where we know we can start to build a trusting collaborative relationship between the two teams. So an analytic translator lives in this between team space. And the way that we start to get there is admitting there is a problem, designating who might be oriented that way already, interested in learning these skills, who wants to place themselves in that um, between team place, and prioritize the handoffs.
because more than anything, we need somebody who understands both languages, the language of business, the language of data science, so that both sides start to appreciate each other. And we spend time actually learning how would in that situation, you make that other side feel good about what just happened? How do you help them appreciate why we had to do that in a particular way and what value that brings? Can we help each other understand why it might take a little longer, but do it in a way that we appreciate it and it's not just simply one more delay or that the person doesn't know what they're doing? So these are sort of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. To what extent do we rely on literacy, which is a wonderful objective? Do we train everyone and try and get everyone to the top? Or do we start to specialize and have data team members help get more of their business colleagues with some basic skills. So maybe there are some business folks who really want to have higher levels of literacy, to really understand what's going on because that's how they would like to build their career, but not ask them to become an expert, just encourage them. And how do we then also identify data individuals who would love to become a translator and build this allegiance between the teams. So instead of saying every single person has to get from the bottom to top and that everyone has to catch up with data literacy, how do we help both teams get better and appreciate each other? If we think about how we would measure the value of translators, we can just simply look at what we're experiencing because the communication isn't effective now. Have we reduced the number of times that we had to rework a project? Have we been able to accomplish more because we're getting it right the first time? Have we reduced turnover? because we have more top performers who are happy to be there and feeling appreciated and knowing that they're doing really well for the business. Can we document that we're getting more done and spending less time spinning our wheels or going back and confirming or reconfirming? And across these opportunities, can we start to keep track of how many solutions for the business were actually initiated by the data team? New ideas, new products, new ways of establishing success and producing marketing materials, new efficiencies that were proposed by the data team rather than having them simply be ticket takers who get requests. I have one student who sent me a note after becoming really, really good at the communication aspect. And she said, you know, given my experience now in the work that I'm doing, now that I know how to figure out what they want, I think that one data analyst who's using this set of tools in analytic translation is probably producing more useful output than two analysts who don't know how to do this. So I was very grateful and so pleased to hear that somebody was experiencing this level of proficiency and understanding that value. So I will wrap up here and let you know that we do have analytic translator training available now on uh, Dataversity. And I have to say again, thank you to Shannon and Tony for um, giving me a home for that training. 
And we are developing, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, communication for data professionals as well. So let me stop here and take any questions. Wendy, thank you so much as always for another great presentation. I always just, I love your content so much. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. Um, and if you have questions for Wendy, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. Um, there is a question that came in here. Uh, Wendy, what are you, what, um, what you are suggesting as an analytic translator um, is uh, is what a competent business analyst should be doing, isn't it? I've heard some complaints from business and tech teams working on the average run from um, the run of the mill OLTP project. I don't think it being analytic project makes it different. Yeah, um, I have worked with a lot of business analysts and I do, I do think they are oriented more toward solutions than some uh, some folks. But I have not seen them get communication training. I see them being better at understanding the business need than some data scientists, perhaps. But I have not seen them get trained specifically in number one how to communicate, and number two, emphasizing the relationship aspect of it. So you're right that they have a, uh, a step ahead in the fact that they understand the business priorities, but they don't necessarily do the relationship building from what I have seen. Now, obviously I haven't worked with every business analyst out there, but that has been my impression thus far. Perfect. And Wendy, you know, how do you see analytics tra analytic translators differing from traditional data governance roles like data stewards, business and analytics stewards, analytic developers? Seems like data governance roles, when uh, appropriately skilled and functionally correctly, are already translators, especially if they are domain centric or business embedded. Think true yeah. self service. Yeah, kind of yeah. very similar, but mm -hmm. yes, I will. I will answer it the same way that. Um, there are many roles where people do very useful things and they translate certain aspects of what's going on, but rarely are they, um, rarely do they see themselves as being responsible for the dynamic. Now, they may be good at that, at diffusing tensions between the teams. They may be good at translating language between the teams, but they may not have it in their own goals to have Mr. Data and Mr. Business start to really appreciate each other and seek out each other's input. So it's about the goal that they have now they may be great at it. And as I said, I, I was operating as an analytic translator for years before I realized that that's what I probably was doing. Um, so there are people who are probably doing this. They don't call themselves that. They just happen to be the person that everyone wants to have at the meeting because they make it go smoother. But I would say the difference is that they are dedicated, analytic translators are dedicated to healing the dynamic and building a relationship so that it can be um, really thriving and valuing each other. Perfect, thank you. So Wendy, as a public information coordinator with a data governance office, I find the biggest problem is just getting the business side to, to hear my team out regarding why data-driven solutions are needed. Would doing basic literacy skills be the best approach for at least getting them interested in what we do? Um, if they are asking for it, yes. And 
if there is some way to encourage that, yes. But I go back to the article in Forbes that says, if you start to point fingers and say that things would be better if you guys just weren't so stupid about data, and I know you wouldn't say that, but that's how it feels. It doesn't help build the alliance. And so what I would start with, um, with any business team is having discussions with them, open-ended discussions with them with very um, probing questions about what their major challenges are. What is keeping them up at night? What are the main goals that they have? What are the things that they are trying to achieve? And 99 times out of 100, those things probably would go better if they had timely, accurate, um, well, constructed data insights. But if you say, why aren't you interested in data? They don't care about data for data. They care about what's keeping them up. So until we show that we are really informed about and concerned about what matters to them, they aren't going to turn around and be concerned about what matters to us. So I start by becoming very, very aware and empathetic and appreciating what the business team is facing and start to brainstorm, even not that first conversation, but maybe the second or third, start to brainstorm in the background, what could we bring them that would make that better? And if we can bring something that would make that better, why don't we have them start to learn that they can rely on us. So we're not pushing that we have data, we're just providing them with solutions that happen to come from data. Very nice. The, um, it, for this next question, in, in the analytics teams I've been on throughout my career, these people must, th be fluent in data and business, but I see that you are proposing a dual-sided approach where an analytic translator can come from business and the analytics side to mutually understand each other. This is great, but do you, who do you being the, who, who becomes the initiator of bridging these groups? Who starts? That's a, that's a good question. Most of the time, um, my experience has been that <clears throat> I get hired by an executive who knows they have value in their data, but they haven't been able to get it yet. So I get hired within an organization to be the bridge between the executive and the data team. And either way, whoever starts, the other team is always suspicious. Like, why are you bringing her in here? when we've been working hard on this for a long, long time. So it requires that we build bridges to both sides. I think it could happen either way. And there've been occasions where I was brought in by the analytic uh, side, not by the um, business side. But once again, there has to at least be a crack in the door so that there is a willingness to have a discussion to start with. But when we start by asking the other team about their challenges and about what's going on and show real empathy and appreciation, that's how it gets started. Totally makes sense. So uh, lots of questions going on in the uh, chat here. Um, how best to build towards analog translator if pivoting uh, into role from business without hard analytic skills? How hard? How much hard skills are needed, and what are what are, what hard skills roadmap? And what is hard skills roadmap? Yeah. Um. I when I first started doing this, I thought either side. Um, you could come from either side, and I think you can to a certain extent and build. Um, the relationships. 
And so I would not discourage you from learning about uh, all of these techniques and all of these um, communication skills. I do find though that if you don't have enough analytic awareness and familiarity, whether you run machine learning models yourself or have built databases um, and extracted information and done all of those steps, you need to have enough understanding of what it's gonna take to get something done. So that when a business person says, oh, well, can't they just do that by tomorrow? You know that either, yeah, sure, you could do that by tomorrow, or they're talking about like a three month project. And so that's impossible so that you can be an educator about what it might take to do. So that's the that's the the caveat that I would say is it's not that you have to have done them all. It certainly helps if you've done a lot of that. But understanding what it's going to take or having a collaboration with somebody else that comes with you when you're having those kind of scoping meetings who can tell you, you know, what it really is going to take. Um, and what the alternatives might be, um, that would be why I would say that. Perfect. Wendy, thank you so much. That makes total sense. Um, and, and, you know, I highly recommend that Wendy's book, Analytic, uh, Becoming an Analytic Trans, Become an Analytic Translator. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's very fascinating uh, and really good uh, source of communication training. And again, the training on dataversity.net that we have been privileged to get as well with Wendy, a partner on Wendy, with Wendy on. Well, Wendy, thank you so much. Uh, that is all the questions that we have for today. It has been such a great webinar. Uh, and just a reminder to all the community and to all of our attendees out there, so I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the day. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.